Good afternoon, and welcome to Expose Yourself to Art, a show that looks at the creative process by inviting artists to join us in a chat about their life and their work. My name is David Schrader, and with me as always is my co-host, Linda Scheller. Come on in, Linda. Here you are. How are you today? I'm fine, David. How are yeah. you? Good, it's a lovely spring day. Very bright out. And um, so, let's get right to our guest. Um, his name is Aaron Draper. He's a photographer. <clears throat> uh, he worked for some time in Modesto and then moved up to Chico where he went back to school and got a master's degree and is now um, teaches photography. Plus, he also does a lot of very interesting projects. And in my estimation, he's a very creative uh, photographer. So if you have ever, ever had any thoughts about whether photography is an art, uh, this is a guy to look at. So come on in, Aaron. Hi there. Welcome. Hi, guys. Thank you for hey. having me. Yeah, it's great. So anyway, um, to start things off, um, you know, I knew you when you were working in Modesto. And when we started a show called, um, uh, what was it? Fo oh, Photo Modesto, that's what it was. And we were starting to bring in people uh, that had photo uh, collections to look at. And you were one of the first people we brought in. And uh, the first show you brought in was something called Underexposed, where uh, you were taking pictures of people who were, what, living on the street or the... They they fit the the topic underexposed very much. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, you mentioned uh, you mentioned I was I was based in Modesto, Dave, and I'd like to say um, just a shout out to everybody the two hundred nine still. I my heart is still down there. Um, uh, loved my time in Modesto and loved my time having a studio and servicing uh, my clients there in Roseburg Square. I yeah, I'm a huge huge 209 at heart still. So um, even though I'm, I'm up here now, but uh, yeah, it, that project underexposed started down there. And yeah. um, that was where I shot my first four or five, four or five subjects that sort of uh, okay. started me on that journey of exploring their narratives and their, okay. their stories. Yeah. yeah. It was well, before, before we get to that, okay. Um, let's, let's talk about you. Uh, tell us a little bit about your, development and how you got into uh photography and how you came to be in modesto so um i was a um an art student that was uh loved drawing fantasy art like you know dwarves and uh elves and dragons and things like that uh it came from a strong uh fantasy book reading and dungeons and dragons playing in high school uh, unfortunately uh, my art professors at chico state did not think that was, I was really good. <laughs> and, the, and those were good topics for me to be uh, drawing. So they encouraged me to find another major. Uh, and I did, I, I went into English and I, cause I figured that was my next best thing I was sort of good at. And uh, it turned out I wrote for an, a local newspaper and there they had two photographers uh, who got jammed up one day on a job and couldn't shoot a couple things and asked me if I could. And I went out and shot it and they, apparently thought I was good enough to shoot and kept asking me to shoot some more. And that's sort of where I started getting into photography. It was, they, it was necessity sort of. Uh, did they really su suggest you find another? Uh, they did. That was, yeah. I, I joke about that all the time. And I tell my students that uh, I was, I wasn't good enough to be a, an artist here at Chico state, but I'm good enough to teach you guys. <laughs> so, so yeah. Yeah. yeah so they, uh, they didn't see the talent in me and uh, <laughs> just thought that I needed to find something else. So I, yeah. I did. Yeah. Then you switched to English. Uh, Linda, wasn't that, was that your major too? English? Yes, that was my major. Yeah. And I went into teaching as well. At what point did you decide to teach, Aaron? Ooh, I never wanted to teach. Like okay. never, never. Uh, no offense, Linda, um, but okay. my 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 mom was an English teacher, and I saw her workload, uh, and I knew I never wanted to teach that for sure. Um, and then I I after I shut my studio down in Modesto and came up um, up to 
up the back to Chico area. Um, my parents encouraged me to finish my degree. And I think I was almost 40 at that time. And so I went back to Chico and finished my English degree that I'd started when I was, you know, the dropout from my teen years. And um, uh, I took, I needed to take one more class. Uh, and so I filled it with an advanced digital photography class and the instructor there, um, excuse me, who was the chair of the department at the time, he encouraged, he saw that I really enjoyed and had a passion for photography and was showing students about lighting and sharing some of my stuff. And he was like, wow, it looks like you have a good rapport with students. Have you ever considered teaching? And I said, never, <laughs> never. <laughs> I'm going to get my English degree and get out of here and go do something else. Uh, and he said, you should consider it. And that's, that's who planted the first seed was, uh, was that the chair of that department at Chico State? Yeah. Uh -huh. So it's sort yeah. of crazy. It went, it sort of came full circle back through Chico. Mm -hmm. So uh, you spent time in Modesto, but uh, that this is not your home. Uh, you didn't grow up here. Where, no. How did you get here? What, so I got happening? married. I got married to a gal. Um, and she was from Tracy and uh, she worked in Modesto. And uh, that was the, I guess that was the best place for us to go. And um, she honestly made lots more money than me. So uh, I was making. Oh, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> that, was the only, that wasn't the only determination, but I think I made about eight bucks an hour writing full time at the newspaper. And so she's like, you know, you're going to have to come down here because there's no way. I mean, you know, there's no work for me up there. And so I, I acquiesced and went down there and started Modesto. Yeah. And I, I waited yeah. tables. Uh, and, until I got started and stuff and found a, uh, you know, and started photography. I waited tables for a couple of years and met a lot of people at La Parilla, which is still my favorite Mexican restaurant in the area. Aha. So when, when did you pick up your camera the first time? Um, yeah. So I, I mean, you I, told me about the school, but down right. here. Yeah. So down there, it came to where, um, I had, I had, I'd, I'd, I did the little whole, a little bit of the, um, photography for the newspaper before I left and, you know, moved to Modesto. Um, but I hadn't really shot any jobs, jobs. It's just for the newspaper. Uh, my, uh, one of my sisters got married and asked me to shoot her wedding. And so I shot it with a tripod with me and some shots and shot the rest. And then whenever I was in a shot, I'd try to put my timer on and run back and shoot me in the shot too. And it turned out all of her friends liked it. So I started booking weddings. And then as I waited tables in Modesto, I started too to shoot weddings down there. And I think I did like three or four my first year in business. And the next year it was 16. And the next year it was probably about 40. And then from then on, I, I averaged anywhere from 50 to 60 weddings a year for about 10 years. So if you don't know anybody, then you're wanting to make friends in a new town or a new place, go to a wedding because there's loads and loads of people there <laughs> and you will have a huge network after a minute. Wow. I mean that that's quite a uh, that's a success story. I mean, starting out with a couple weddings and ending up with shooting 40, 50 weddings a year. Man. Yeah, it was uh, it was definitely it, it was definitely a really quick growth. I think there was it was right when film and digital were sort of. Uh, I was shooting. I started shooting. I think thirty ish weddings a year film with a Hasselblad, and then a, a candid camera, a little thirty five mil Nikon uh, with thirty five millimeter film, black and white. So I'd shoot both of those. Uh, and then when things went to digital, uh, it's, you know, it just kept going. So, uh, yeah. But I still remember the days of negatives and going through negatives and trying to find those. I've got clients today from 20 years ago that still uh, email me and find me and ask if I've got their negatives or, you know, if I, if they can find, you know, get those or they've lost theirs or, you know, all kinds of stuff still. Uh -huh. So are you self-taught photographically? Yeah. I am. I'm self-taught and I was spent time at the library uh, and I bought lots of books back when we used books. So, um, yeah, it was a bummer. I, if you if you're learning on a Hasselblad or you're learning on a camera, it's really awful to like have to bracket and check and see what apertures mean and shoot at a different aperture and shoot all this film and then to get it back. And then you forgot, like, which frame was 5.6 and which was eight. Was it reversed? So then you don't even know, like. There's such a delay to get film back that it's real hard to match your proofs with your notebook to try to figure out what shutter speed was doing and how it was affecting the. So it took me, I think I didn't understand 
aperture shutter speed and ISO, the relationship between those three for like probably two or three years. And then finally I was like, oh my gosh, that's what that, why that works. Wow. Um, yeah. So now that my students get it in like a, like a week, I'm, I'm like, you guys, this took me like a couple of years to figure out. So you were, <laughs> you were fast tracked. You guys yeah. are good to go. Yeah. Now that you're teaching, Aaron, how does that affect your, your own art? Ooh, a lot. Um, number one, it affects it where I feel like sometimes I'm not as good as my students. Um, actually, I feel like that a lot. I feel like they have these amazing voices um, and these insanely creative uh, ideas and concepts. And I think the concepts, Linda, are what I, I've always struggled with. Um, like finding my own voice. Like in writing, you if the more you write, the more you start to find your own voice. And when people read it, they say, well, that's, this sounds like you. In photography, I believe there's the same phenomenon where after you shoot for a while, uh, you get to a place where people look at your work, they're like, oh, that looks like Draper. Um, to me, um, technique is only part of it. Part of it also is also your the concept or the narrative or the story, right? Um, and I feel like both of those need to be there together to form a, a, a to form a, a impactful and meaningful photo. Anybody can learn technique, right? And monkeys can do it. Everybody can do that eventually. But to tell a story and visually communicate your own personal stuff, that is super, super important. Concepts, though, for me, I struggled with because it's a commercial guy. I just, um, I did what the client wanted me to do. So I was sort of doing it for them and what they wanted. And yeah, I do it technically correct. That I didn't express myself a lot, um, and my students do, and so that to me is one of the huge things that I admire and like about them, and um, and sort of like have been learning to do better because I'm encouraging them to do that is to actually find the stuff I'm interested in. That's where sort of the underexposed series was like one of my first times ever where I came out and had something to say myself. Like I thought, wow, this is something I'm passionate about and I can get behind. And even though they're their stories, I I feel like this is a concept that matters to me and a narrative that matters to me. Um, yeah. It wasn't like that my whole career, you know. Right. I, that that was uh, one of the questions that was coming up for me. It was uh, when did you, you know, uh, commercially you do what the client wants, right? And but at some point you started to expressing what you wanted to say too, and. Uh, that that came in about that time you were well, saying yeah i mean i i still struggle with it david honestly yeah. i mean i i still struggle with you know um thinking of things and and not feeling like because uh, then again i i mean with all the photography out there on social media and and all the people i follow i look at a lot of work and go wow these people are freaking geniuses these are literally geniuses the stuff they come up with how do they come up with this right and that's the genius it, it, you know, not that you execute it perfectly, technically, it's the fact that they're coming up with these amazing concepts. Yeah. And sometimes I get down on myself because I, I don't have a, a, a practice or a habit of doing stuff, stuff like that. And I've struggled with it. Um, but yeah, I, um, I, I go back and forth, David, honestly, there wasn't a time where I was like, Oh, I'm there now. It's to me, it's a struggle. Every project, right? I, uh, everything I've, you know, I, I I do keep a notebook though with stuff, uh -huh. but still, I think it's a struggle for me all the time. Like I don't ever, the struggle is real, as they say. <laughs> yes, <laughs> you know, yeah. you sound like an artist. Uh, I think I think no, I serious. Yeah. All, all all artists struggle with that. You know, am I worthy? Is this right? Yeah. 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 So, so uh, it, well, it, let's let's maybe take a look at uh, one of these first big projects that that you took on and you can tell us where it came from. And okay. so uh, Linda, can we uh, bring up underexposed here? Let's get this in here, right? She'll, we'll get there in a second. So the reason it was- There we are. Oh, yeah, where, tell us about where this well, came from and what it's about. So, um, so when I was downtown in Modesto, um, I would go and shoot my clients downtown a lot and shoot on location down there and find interesting backgrounds and textures and stuff for my portraits. And I increasingly saw more and more uh, homeless down in the areas I'd like to shoot. And um, they're a bummer. Um, I felt like they'd always ask me for money. Um, they would get in my, you know, behind my shot. Excuse me, they're sleeping on the streets. They'd 
be all over the place. And I know that's an increasing problem everywhere. Um, but it became increasingly um, in my way when I was down there, you know, uh, photographing. Right. And so um, I, I went up and asked this guy after one of my senior uh, high school grad shoots, I went up and asked this guy, I said, Hey, I said, um, you know what? I said, what's your story, dude? I said, I, you know, how are you? How are you? And he looked at me like in shock, like, you know, who's speaking to me? And I realized that he probably didn't get spoken to a lot by people that were walking around. And um, he gave me his story and told me that he was a, a shrimper from Louisiana. His boat had caught fire. Um, he, his insurance had lapsed and he lost his only way to make an income. He came out to this area because he had family and uh, his mom and stuff got evicted because something happened with her. And that was it. That was his last like sort of lifeline. And I started to realize that his story was super compelling. Um, I put his story up with it and asked if I could photograph him. And he said, sure. And I said, you know, I said, how about if I pay you? I said, usually I pay models. Uh, and he said, really? And I said, well, yeah. I said, your time is worth just as much as a model's, right? And I said, you're doing this for me. And he said, okay. And so I said, how's a dollar a minute? And he laughed and he said, you know, take all day, man. He goes, I, heard I got all day. <laughs> and I was like, well, I don't, I don't. So uh, anyway, so I photographed uh, Leon, put him up and it was the most followed and most commented on work I'd ever done. And I was like, this is nuts because I've had wedding photos that I thought were amazing and beautiful. I've had senior photos I thought were great. I've had all kinds of other stuff I've shot um, in the last like 10 years. And this is the thing that the people are going to be interested the most in. And it turned out that I provided a safe place for people to talk to these homeless uh, subjects about their lives and find out who they are without having to, you know, interact or put themselves in an uncomfortable position. Right. They, they, um, all these people that were commenting uh, were really interested. And so I kept shooting other people and getting their stories. And it just sort of spiraled on out of that, you know, from that. Yeah. Let's take a look at some of the other images that came with this. Cause you, you started and you uh, kept going with it. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, that's, um, this is, um, these all of these subjects the first one was kenny you saw and this is kevin um kenny uh we had a gala up here in chico a fundraising gala for one of the homeless shelters and he actually got to go to it and got dressed up and they had wine and cheese and it was this big bougie event uh and he got to talk a little bit about the project and about one of his photos that was printed uh 30 by 40 on aluminum and hung and um he was really i I think that was one of the coolest things he said has ever happened uh, to him to be like talked to and thought of his art. Uh, and uh, this is Kevin. He's bipolar. Um, he's, I think he has multiple degrees uh, in art and art history. And he, he lives up here in this area. And um, uh, I befriended him and asked him if I could photograph him. And he said, uh, sure. And I usually, when I photograph my subjects, I both pay them number one because I value their time. And then two, uh, I print a, a five by seven um, portrait of what you see here on metal aluminum. That way it, it's, it remains really well and doesn't get damaged if they, you know, if they have to move around and then, you know, get crumpled like paper. Um, and then I give it, I find them and give it to them. So they have a really interesting sort of nice photo of themselves. And most of them uh, cry, uh, you know, when they receive this because, I don't know how long it's been since they've been photographed or if they've ever been photographed like this uh, to see themselves sort of like this. Right. Uh, and so for me, it's a, um, I don't know, it turned out to be a really fun project. I, um, a lot of people reached out to me in uh, homeless advocacy, advocacy groups uh, in Grass Valley in the East Bay and up here in Chico and Modesto also uh, like the Salvation Army and other groups and asked if they could use my images for their, uh advertising and advocacy uh and it turned out where it worked for everybody the the groups got to use this, the photos uh to um, promote their you know their outreach and stuff uh and they don't have a budget for commercial photography so uh, they got to have these and the subjects themselves were the were were able to help generate money for the 
groups that serve them. So it just sort of worked, uh, it sort of worked full, full circle. We have a question. Um, what time of day was this photo of Kevin taken? Um, this is probably, it's probably 4 p.m. That's a great question. Yeah. Um, yeah, time of day is, 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 is super important. This here though, I mean, just to let you guys know, um, I started working with neutral density filters also, right? So this is daylight, but it's probably three or four in June. And I'm using a big octagon off camera left, just outside of camera. And then I've got a neutral density filter to make it even darker. And so I can shoot with a more, a, a bigger aperture. So mm -hmm. most of my stuff is shot like long lens, probably, oh, the top one with Kenny was shot with a 135 millimeter with a neutral density filter on it. And this one was probably similar, but probably this looks like more like an 85. But yeah, but I darken all my images up and shoot neutral density in the summer, in the day. Okay. Well, that's somewhat different uh, than a lot of people who would go out and do uh, what you might call street photography. You're actually going out there and taking portraits of these people. Right. And that's one of the controversial things that sort of happened when I was in grad school at the Academy of Art um, was that people were saying, this is not how you should photograph homeless. And there's a huge back and forth um, discussions and arguments online. Um, a lot of people accuse me of exploiting the homeless, um, of making money off this, of um, uh, all kinds of stuff. And um, which none of that was true. I didn't make a dime. In fact, I spent money on the whole project, thousands of dollars over the course of me doing it. And I still do it occasionally when I have time, I go out and befriend homeless subjects and try to photograph them also. Uh, but I've donated to homeless you know, places and and tried to raise money for them too. And they, I know them by name. I've invited them to their galas and showings. And um, yeah, so that, but the, the problem was, is they didn't think that um, you should commercially light people like this uh, the way you used to do it or th the way people a lot of times used to do it was like black and whites, uh, them laying on the ground, not a very distinguished look. And it's sort of just grungy and edgy and gritty. Right. And a, a real, right. Nice right. Stuff. Uh, and not very respectful to me and not very, um, human. And so my goal was to, uh, light these people. Like I would light any of my clients that are paying me money. Uh, and why not light them the same way? Right. Yeah. I love yeah. the dignity that comes through the two that we've just seen. Thank you, Linda. These are beautiful portraits. Yeah. Let's run through uh, the series, um, you know, see what, uh, maybe you can just give us the names of these people. We don't have to, you know, do the whole story, but. Yeah, this is Johnny Antone. Um, he was just a brief thing of him. He chose to live on the streets. A lot of people yeah. say, well, these people cho choose to do this. Um, some are addicts and having a hard time. Some are mentally ill. Um, lots of veterans. He's a veteran. Uh, he's also a retired um, uh, mechanic, and he's just living on the streets because his his um, what do you call it? His pension goes farther on the street than it would you know if he had to live somewhere. And so he he is choosing to live on the streets. John is. Okay. Next. This is Kitana, and you don't find it's really really tough to have photographs of children that are homeless. Um, so there's only, I think one in my series over the, like the 10 years I did it. One mom agreed to do it, who was in a shelter in Grass Valley. Um, and they are afraid of having, uh, getting their children taken away. Right, so they don't. They don't do this, yeah, okay. They don't want their kids photographed usually. So it's really hard to get children. And I thought this was beautiful of her. Um, this was lit in a room again with like a three probably a three foot little octobox to camera right and i drug the shutter probably to a 15th of a second eighth of a second to bring in the ambient uh -huh. that way the room looks tries to match her you know the light on her face she's still a little bright but yeah and is there more yeah yeah i think there's a couple more i included okay. um this is maddie i never saw her again um and I was experimenting with her and her pit, her little pity. Um, uh, she introduced me to how the structure of the street works, where this is called flying a, flying, flying a sign, <clears throat> excuse me. 
and um, that everybody's got corners and that corners are by seniority and certain corners down in the East Bay here, this is in Oakland, um, certain corners make more money and make less and fights break out when you don't uh, respect seniority uh, and how the corners are mapped out for certain people. Uh, so it's not everybody that can just go stand on a corner. Uh, you got to have permission or you have to have to build up some seniority there to do it. Okay. Is there another? Yeah, there we go. This is um, Ed, and he introduced me to how you could live on, like, I think he said about $10 a day um, go, using Starbucks hot water and Top Ramen and finding stuff on sale. He's an incredibly shrewd truck driver that had his back thrown out um, and then um, a long haul truck driver. And then that was sort of where he ended up. This is downtown Sacramento by the train depot. Okay. And lastly, this is Spaceman. And Spaceman, I never got his real name. Um, I know he traveled around a lot, but he was a uh, recover, well, not recovering. Uh, he was a current meth, meth addict. And I wasn't sure exactly this time here, he wasn't completely um, super coherent. So I had to come back and get him to sign a model's release another time when he was. Um, but this photo I like the best. Uh -huh. So I kept this one. Yeah, it's a really powerful one. So model release, you actually, you treated them as models well this is that's what i'm saying david is i mean this is a commercial as a, a commercial photographer approach yeah. in order to use images of people right in a commercial way you need their permission number one uh and generally you pay them and right so it's it's you don't shoot them without their permission laid on the ground um just because they're in a public space doesn't mean i understand that they they don't have a, a, an expectation of privacy after, you know, law school. <laughs> they don't have an expectation <laughs> of privacy in a public space. I get that. Uh, but still, I think people deserve a little privacy, even in public. I mean, just yeah. especially if you, they live there. So, uh -huh. yeah. Well, I remember when this, uh, when you brought your show to Missling Gallery, I mean, it's quite a, it's a very powerful show. So, Tell us about it, about the series. What happened What happened with the series? What happened with you because of this? Uh, um, well, so it turns out um, it got picked up. I think I was teaching, uh, it was my first, I think it was my first semester at Chico State. Um, I got hired at the last semester of grad school and was commuting two days a week to Chico, Tuesday and Thursday from San Francisco, um, which, was a, which was a drag. One of my students ended up working for Discovery channel or something of that nature. I forgot the name of the place, but they asked to pick up. She remembered I'd done this project because I showed a couple of images in class. And then she asked her, her producer talked to her and she pitched it to her producer. Her producer put it up and within like an hour, um, Board Panda, um, F Stoppers, like everybody had got it also and shared it. And then it went viral and then it was I think it was translated in over 50 or 60 languages. I got magazine offers um, all over the world, Russian, China, um, Taiwan, um, uh, Netherlands, like all over the place, and then got invited to uh, to um, to headline uh, Romania, um, uh, what do you call it, Photo Week in Romania, and then went to Seattle and lectured on it and got to talk a little bit about it. And so it was, uh, it was sort of a, a rush all at once. I, I had so many emails coming in that I couldn't. I, I just saw the other day that I had emails I hadn't responded to. Like I went back looking for an image or um, I'm um, a magazine cover that I was on and I was looking for one of the the people I'd spoken to and I found like several produce uh, publishers that I just hadn't responded to that were that were uh, <laughs> asked me if I would please send them images and stuff. So it was it was really fast and really uh, um, yeah, just a really fast deal. I'm, I really enjoyed it. I mostly enjoyed the fact that I was, I felt like I was helping, um, shed a light on some of the, um, some of maybe the people that, who couldn't didn't have a voice for themselves, uh, and maybe showcase them in a way that was beautiful and that um, other people might respect them more if they saw them in a respectful light. Um, you know, it's sort of like the thing where yeah, if you have a, um, a broken window in your house in your neighborhood. 
uh, people tend to throw stuff in your yard and it's the whole, um, you know, when something's, you know, crappy looking, they tend to people dump on it and make it look worse. Um, but if it looks really nice, people tend to not. So um, I feel like the same philosophy applies here where if you make people look beautiful, people are less likely to dump on them and stuff. You know, they, they tend to dump on people more when they think they can. So very powerful messages. Uh, so uh, when you went back to school, you got your master's degree. Uh, my understanding is you have to do a master's uh, project. Was this your project? Or? It was. Yeah, right. I showed it to my professors down at the Academy of Art, and um, they boohooed it uh, and said, this is not going to work because it's homeless and this is cliche and everybody's done this before. And um, and then I showed them sort of how I wanted to do it in a more um, portraits portraiture type way, um, how I normally photograph portraits. Um, I showed them some uh, examples of Rembrandt and how I wanted to light them and uh, with external lighting and bringing out like a lighting setup and sandbags and uh, light stands and, you know, uh, the whole works. And they thought, well, this sounds more like a production than it does of just snapping shots of people on the street. And I said, yeah, well, that's what I'm sort of going for. And then they okayed it. But they were really um, all my advisors. Um, I think there were three of a panel of three including the director, were all really skeptical uh, and weren't really completely on board uh, in, the be in the beginning. <laughs> They've reached out since. <laughs> um, yeah, some of the uh, some of my images down are still down there. Um, and a couple of the, the uh, professors that remain there, a couple of the directors and stuff, have reached out since and asked if they could use them to promote some of their, you know, their uh, former students. So it worked out well. But yeah, they weren't completely on board in the beginning. Yeah. Okay. I'm glad. I'm glad they've come around because it's a it's a very powerful series. So. Well, thank you. I yeah. I, there's a lot of humanity to it, and that's what I feel like is the yeah. the calling card. I think of the series. Yeah. So um, you've done other series of things. I mean, you could you continue uh, as I followed you. You know, at least on Facebook and things like that. You know, you continue to do. Uh, student shots do you still do weddings i do i still yeah. do weddings i was just in mexico um when was i in mexico january february january i was in mexico january in puerto Vallarta shooting a wedding uh i've got i flew back in time to start class uh at chico state and teach and then i i've shot several students weddings and i still shoot weddings and i still shoot weddings in modesto uh surprisingly and and senior high school uh grads like i I still work for, um, I still do shoots for uh, Central Catholic High and some other high school uh, high schools down there. I just returned down there to do a um, a, um, a funeral for Mary Lyons. Um, so I still, and it's crazy that once, I feel like once you're at the 209 is very unique and that once you're in the 209 and you've made and established connections and networking there, um, people remember you. Like it's, I my studio hasn't been in, in in uh, you know operating in Modesto since 2010 right when i left um so it's been what 11 12 years and i'm still i still have clients that i'm still shooting down there new ones and uh you know you know and former ones so it's a real testament david um we spoke a little before the show about how um how you continue to be successful in photography or in business and i believe a lot of it is developing relationships and making sure you keep people happy. And if you do, they'll find you, yeah. uh, you know, three hours is not, I just had a, a mortgage route come up to Chico to shoot in the studio here from Modesto um, this last week. So they'll, they'll find you and they'll come uh, and they'll, uh, they'll continue to use you <laughs> if you make them happy, you know? Yeah. Uh, do you have any samples? Uh, do we have any samples? that we can bring up of some of the work you've done is either as uh, what uh, student shots or are you, uh, are you thinking weddings? senior high school grads? Are you thinking, Oh, this is the, the, the arch DICs, DICs of, uh, I didn't even know how to say that. DICs. Do you yeah. uh, of, uh, she's uh Sacramento and I got hired to go down and photograph an environmental portrait of her. Um, that was super fun. It was one of those things where she has a 10 minute window. And you got to sit somebody in the chair, light it, um, get it ready. And so she, when she steps in, you shoot it and you're done. 
So that was a real fun job. Uh, I really enjoyed it. My environmental portraiture for me is where I really like, I just, I don't know. I just really like people. So. Yeah. And you, yeah. This is, this is Phil. He's from Stockton. He drove up to our law library in Chico at law school. And he wanted a, his idea in his head. Phil is not a large man. Uh, Phil is, I, oh gosh, I don't want to even say how Phil. I can't remember how Phil tall Phil is, but he's a little short. He's, <laughs> he's shorter than me. Um, and he wanted to appear a little larger. And I think we got on the vibe of like, if you were an attorney for the Sopranos, how would you look? And this is what <laughs> we came up with. And so um, he was happy with this. <laughs> so yeah. He liked it because he looks really, you know, powerful and awesome. Yeah. So the uh, you know relationships that you develop with your subjects, it sounds like that that plays a big role in the final product. Oh, it totally does. Yeah, I I think the um, yeah. I, I so I shot Phil's wedding, and it was like three or four years ago. This shoot was three or four years later, right? So um, he was happy with me. He was happy with me with at the wedding and that point, and then continued to use me for you know other stuff. And it it works out where brides have jobs right brides and grooms have other jobs besides being your bride and groom when they leave they go back to work you know after the wedding and then if they need photos done they're like heck let's see if our guy that we really liked can do this and if you made them happy and they enjoyed working with you they'll enjoy working with you again yeah uh, so what else do we have in this series oh there we go oh so this is uh andrew he's a soccer player um Yay. We waited till clearly, right? He's a soccer player. I don't know why I said that. He's holding the <laughs> soccer ball out in the soccer field. So, yeah. Um, this was, um, again, this is sort of the way I like the light, right? Um, I like to sort of match ambient a little bit with, um, you know, a big softbox and do sort of a almost a Rembrandt type uh, short lighting on people's faces. Um, and so, yeah, we waited. The clouds broke. Um, they're sort of cloudy. And we were waiting. And as soon as the cloud and the sun came down through, we just shot and it worked out where this is it. Yeah, it was super I fun. I love it. This is yeah. my favorite sport. And oh, it awesome. just has it has an intensity. It just feels like he's going to move any second. It, it, that's so great. Yeah, I mean, this is um, something um, that I feel like. So it's, it's really weird. Uh, guys usually don't like their senior photos taken when they graduate high school. They do it for their mothers usually, uh, and their mothers are, you know, nagging them and they come out and do it. And usually they don't really want to, and they drag their feet. Um, so I'll shoot the normal standard stuff that moms like. And then I tell the, the gentleman, I'm like, look, you guys, my goal is to make you, make you have something that you love and think is sort of, you know, edgy and awesome where you look epic. Um, how I, you know, what I, the word I would use, um, and how I would want to look when I was your age and I didn't get to look. I had this stupid like Olin Mills type, uh, you know, tux on and I'm, I never wore a tux my entire life. So why am I getting photographed in a tux? I mean, it, it, I look nothing like myself. Right. And then my face looked all smooth and perfect and creamy. And I was like, gosh, this, I just looked, I didn't look great. I didn't feel like me. And so for, for guys, I say, look, if you play a sport, let's make you look like you're just crushing that sport. Like we're going to light you up. We're going to have a fog machine. I don't care what we bring out, but we're going to make this look like, you know, you're just the deal. So, yeah, that's what right. I do. So uh, it's the second time you've used uh, Rembrandt as a reference. So uh, it seems like your uh, what past interest in art uh, has had, well, an, had an impact on you. They do, well, yeah, I mean the real <laughs> the real artists. Yes, yeah, 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 yeah. Right. They definitely have an impact, right? Yeah. Um, I I think um, how they use color. Uh, I've been getting into a lot lately. Um, their lighting, their lighting on faces and how they lit stuff, and more of some of the more dramatic scenes. I love. Um, in fact, I loved it so much. We got into uh, where I introduced um, uh, portrait lighting for intermediate students where we where we do like um split butterfly uh rembrandt and loop lighting and i show them how it all changes with based on where your, the shadow of your nose is B going from most dramatic to least dramatic which is like flat lighting right so um yeah and how to create mood right it's all 
what a lot of people don't really realize is that light is, has a lot to do with mood, but shadow, dude, shadow is where the mood is, right? Yeah. And, and so when you're, you're shooting available light and there's hardly no shadow in your shot, yeah, it's bright and airy and fun. Not always very moody, though. But if you can make a shot and introduce shadow, right? Shadow is the offset of the highlight. That's what renders 3D, right? The difference between, a, and I tell my students this, the difference between a circle and a sphere is a shadow. Draw a circle on your wall right. or a piece of paper. If it's just a circle, it's flat. There's no depth to it. You add a shadow to it now, now you got your depth. So for me, it's it's almost more about shadow than it is light these days. Uh -huh. So what's this one? Here we this have. Is, this is painting with light. It's a fiber optic cable uh, where you turn the camera on for like 30 seconds in a dark room, and then you just paint the subject with uh, fiber optic cables. Okay. Was this a... Um... This is uh, what uh, this is probably a student demo. A student demo. That's yeah. what I was wondering. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. And this down here, this is a campaign I did for. So again, when people and photographers, when it comes to jobs, I don't usually turn my nose up at a lot of jobs. I usually try to figure out what I can do to help them and what I can do. Uh, honestly, to make money, right? Because I mean, at the end of the day, if you're relying on your photography to pay your bills or your arts pay your bills, sometimes you have to take jobs you wouldn't normally take. This is for an old folks home in Folsom. Why am I shooting for an old folks home in Folsom? Uh, well, um, they because of the COVID situation in the old folks homes during the COVID crisis, um, the old folks homes got a really bad rap right? Lots of uh, mismanagement. Uh, a lot of them were uh, elderly were dying in them. Uh, so there wasn't a great feeling about them. So they needed immediate uh, um, imagery, photos and video to show people on the outside that they could come in. It was safe. They were doing okay. Their residents were happy. This was the vibe inside uh, because they were getting such uh, a different vibe from like media and stuff that, you know, people dying and all this, all this. And it was true. They were. But when you run uh, retirement homes for the elderly uh, and, you know, assisted living homes, that's not a good uh, message to be out all over everywhere, right? You're, you're, uh, nobody's going to want to come live at your place. So um, they hired me to come do this uh, for them. And this is a shot. Again, I was joking around with this. I think her, the woman's name is Beverly. Um, I was joking around with her. And a lot of the engagement is us joking around while I'm shooting. Right. I'll make comments, offhanded comments about, you know, this or that. And some might be appropriate. Some might be not. But whatever it takes to get them to sort of like break out a little bit and, you know, uh, break the sort of the the stiffness off. Um, this is one of those moments where she was laughing and then she turned and looked at the caregiver and it just worked. Right. And then uh -huh. what, the relationship between caregivers and the residents there that they're, you know, they like each other and they're they care for each other. And that's sort of what this was about. Next. This is a, um, there's a couple casinos up in this area. Actually, there's several. This is Feather Falls Casino, and this is actually day. Um, and I used a Kino Flow. And on the Kino Flow lights, what there was really cool about these is you can turn the Kelvin, the color temperature, sort of how you want and where you want it to go. So before oh. I researched, I researched like what fire Kelvin, like what was the fire for Kelvin rating? And then I set the light to that. So the light looked like it was from the fire, right? Then what you can do too, which is really awesome, is on the Kino Flow's lights, you can push fire flicker and it'll give you this sort of dappled, uh, weird light coming out of it that looks like a fire. It's nuts. So the fire didn't cast any of the light at all in here. The fire is literally just a prop. It doesn't, it's not lighting anything. There's a big Kino Flow to camera right that's lighting the whole, the whole scene. And this was to sort of showcase their, they have an HOA campground on the site. Uh, so we did a lot of stuff inside with gambling and pulling, of course, pulling levers and yelling, yay, you know, we won. And, <laughs> you know, all the, we're going to always win when we come here. <laughs> you know, we did, uh, we showcased the rooms, uh, the couples in their cute bathrobes on the beds, basically the entire two day shoot um, to showcase the facilities and the people there. Yeah. And one of the girls on the far right uh, is Nicole Whitaker and she's from, uh, Turlock. So I actually called her up to come shoot this job for us. But she's in she's in LA now, but she was a Turlock gal. Oh, and actually she's Hilmar. 
Hill, Hillmar graduate. Yeah. Hillmar high. Yeah. There's that's Nicole again, Hillmar high. So she was shooting the pool and um, there, the pool facilities and stuff like that. And she's a, she's a decorated Los Angeles uh, working model. So she came up and it was super easy. Uh huh. Mm, this is a family photo, um, and it looks creepy, and it's supposed to. It's supposed to be a, a Wes Anderson-inspired type photo, um, and this is not their house. They went and rented a little, uh, uh, there's an antique museum place, like sort of like the McHenry Mansion up here, and um, they went and rented a little room out of it, and we got to shoot in it, and um, the, the guy in the back, the dad, uh, Steve Chalet, he's a... Um, an Oscar, like, I think he's won an Oscar for one of his films. He's a video guy up in this area. And he and I worked together on several jobs. And he asked, Aaron, can you please do me a favor and photograph a sort of a whimsical, fun uh, family photo that is, uh, you know, Wes Anderson-ish feel? And I said, okay, let's try it. <laughs> That's what we came up with. Jeez. <laughs> yeah. This is actually a shot for um, this faceware technology, and they wanted a graphic designer. So we we wiped out a room in the in Chico State and set up what looked like to be sort of a graphic design area, uh, and brought this uh, this gal named Casey up. She was one of my former senior high school grads. I don't know if she was, I think she was Mo High maybe, um, but we brought her up from Modesto, and she modeled for me for the shoot. We paid her, and she got a job out of it, and they got to run this as a full page ad in a tech magazine. Yeah. Yeah. It's crazy. A lot of my talent comes from a lot of my I, talent surprisingly comes from the 209. And I, that's where I know people. So I, I still haven't come up to Chico to help out. Yeah. I was just going to mention that. That's where you find your bottles. Yeah. I mean, they're, I mean, yeah, there, there's a lot of beautiful people down there. This is a series I did. Um, this is sort of testing. Oops. Uh, if you go down, let's see. This is Olivia, and I was testing, um, just trying to test out some new tools I was looking for, for to teach with, uh, and one's one's a lens baby, uh, and so I was working with some editing and a lens baby, which is sort of this weird little cheap plasticky type lens, sort of like a Holga, but you put a, it's a little attachment, you stick it on your lens, and then you can sort of bend it around a little bit, and optics aren't great, uh, um, but it's more for a sort of this plastic sort of uh, surreal feel which is on the next slide you'll see, um, that's what we ended up doing with it. We ended up shifting the focus and sort of the focus is on our face and everything else is sort of like weirdly um, out of focus and it sort of works a little bit in terms of like a dream light type thing. Yeah. I do a lot of testing on little gadgets and stuff like that, you guys, all over, all the time, just because I wanna see what we can bring into the classroom to use for students to let them use. Mm -hmm. um, we don't usually have a budget for a lot of it, so I'll purchase it and then let students use it. Oh, this is a shot, a little editorial shot I did of my, uh, this is my niece and my nephew. Um, and I was, I need to shoot a, this kid shot. I entered a competition, didn't win, but I won, I entered a photo contest uh, for kids and I thought this would be fun. And she, I paid them. <laughs> don't worry. I paid them each. I paid Miley 10 bucks and I paid Jackson five. So cause she got more because she got squirted, I think. <laughs> they, they're completely under my direction. I <laughs> told her how to pose, told him how to pose. <laughs> yeah. Uh, cool. So I even I even use my own family. This is uh this is Victoria. I this is uh she has a Pilates studio in Modesto. Um called uh what is her studio called? Studio V. Um, she's a successful, uh, philanthropist down there. She raises money for charities a lot and is really involved in the community. And she asked me to come down and, uh, photograph her at her studio, at her Pilates studio. Again, environmental portrait for, you know, business owners. It's sort of where I, I tend right. to do a lot of. So you also brought, uh, a series of things that your students have done. I did. Yeah. I'm really, I mean, honestly, I, I could talk about my students and their achievements all day because I'm. I'm so proud of like the younger generation and, and their skill level and their their ability to like just learn stuff and how good they are. I mean, I I tell them all the time, I'm like, you guys are way better. Like they're way I didn't even start shooting until I was like 26 or 27. 
and they're like 19 and they're killing it. Like they're so far ahead of me when I was like their age. <laughs> I'm like, you guys are going to be like geniuses. I cannot wait to see what you do because I mean, you're, you're just, uh, you've got such a good head start, uh, you know? And then I struggled with film for years, you know? So geez, I, I didn't even know what I was doing. I don't think until like five or six years into my career. So this is a, this is a studio shot. Um, every year at Halloween, we do pumpkin composites where we learn compositing. So we, it's a hands-on, I'm very tactile and I like to work with our hands. Uh, a lot of photography for me is building and constructing thing. It's not just pushing a button, but a lot of things go wrong and you've really got to problem solve and figure stuff out all the time. Like nothing ever really goes right. So um, this is a, a jack-o'-lantern that the students carved. Um, and then they, their goal is in the two hour window to carve a pumpkin and come up with a concept in two hours and then shoot that concept. So I've got behind the scenes of them carving and videos and stuff too, because I just think it's great. But this is one of the ones I really loved. And so this is in the studio. They went back into the studio and shot this with, again, you'll see some fog. There's a fog machine they kicked on. And then they decided to put a person, that right there is a cookie, right? It's a piece of cardboard cut out. Uh, and they cut a piece of cardboard out to make it look like a window. And then they put just plastic over the person's hands and they got a jacket from our wardrobe closet and put it on the, on the, you know, and then held the pumpkin up there and then composited it in. Wow. <laughs> just, real, just real clever. I mean, stuff, right? I mean, it's, I really enjoy it. This, uh, we don't, we're not allowed to bring alcohol on campus. Uh, so we don't drink it. We just uh, photograph it because sometimes the bottles are really pretty. And, um, and this is a shout out to, um, again, Modesto product, right? I mean, right. this is, <laughs> so uh, we kind of probably found some gallows stuff too, but um, yeah, so I, uh, we shoot splash photography and, uh, and work with uh, white line lighting and black line lighting on uh, glass and bottles and products. And this is just one of the shots a student did. And I thought it was just fantastic. Again, this is their first time ever doing any product work, right? You got to consider uh -huh. that they've shot available light, right? But this is their first introduction into the studio. So, um, yeah, they really enjoy it. This is a um, astronomy club. Every we're just getting ready to go on our astronomy, our astronomy shoot uh, in the next like couple weeks after spring break. But every every year, um, I take my intermediate class up to the mountains. And we do a astro um, astrophotography. Um, again, it's not in my wheelhouse, and it's not what I'm good at. But I like that my students get to go do some other stuff and do some fun things. And it also keeps me where I have to continue to learn how to do other things that are not my strength. Okay. So again, the students tend to push me a lot uh, because I'm trying to find interesting, cool things that they'll like. Yeah. Well, uh, I see we're closing in on the um, the hour. And I don't want to miss this next uh, series that you have, if we can bring it up. Uh, this is yours again. Uh, what did you call it? Whipple or oh, something? This is the, okay, this is the Curious Wanderings of Whipple Stitch. Yes. Yeah, so... Uh, <laughs> like the clown mask right behind me? Yeah. Yeah. Is that the mask you use? It is. I had a, uh, that's made in a, um, a it's Hollywood. It, they're about a, a, anywhere from a thousand to about three grand and they're silicone. Um, and it's from a mask maker down in uh, Los Angeles. And I, I really, uh, did, I committed myself to the project when I bought the mask, honestly. I was like, okay, I'm going to do this and I'm going to spend a couple of years doing this. And every Halloween, Whipple Stitch comes out both on campus. I show up on campus and creep around the library um, I sneak around and knock on windows and peer through windows and stuff uh, for Halloween and uh, show up on a lot of Snapchat, uh, a lot of people's Snapchats. Um, but yeah, we go out, I go out and shoot a self-portrait series and this is it. And I do it every Halloween. So it's been doing, I've been doing it last four, four or so years. Um, one of the ones didn't come out at all and I just junked it and I couldn't, I couldn't even make it come out. So I don't have one for that year, but uh, I've got some of the other ones. In a circus so this, this is a self, uh, could we go back to this previous one? This is a self-portrait? These yeah. are all self-portraits? Yeah, these uh, are all self-portraits. Yeah, I've got a remote in my hand, and I've got a fog machine, and I run over there and shoot it, and I light it above. This is top lit with a big 30, it's a big light on a big, big, tall pole with a couple sandbags on a Matthew stand, 
it's a 30, I think it's a 20 degree grid spot shooting out of my face to look like a light pole. Ah, uh, okay. One light, yeah. Yeah, now we can go on. This one's softbox camera right, and a little carnival came to town, and I went and stood out in front of it. The guy wouldn't let me shoot in the carnival, um, even though I offered to pay him. I offered him 500 bucks, and he still wouldn't let me stand in the carnival and shoot, which is I thought was really weird because I was like, this is a carnival. Yeah. How come the clown can't be here, right? Uh, <laughs> and he goes, oh, no, that's too creepy. We don't like that here. And I was like, what? Okay, well, <laughs> fine. So I went and stood on the grass and had the carnival in the background. <laughs> uh, I still got heckled by some people walking by that was crazy. Like, people don't like clowns, and I don't really either, which is sort of a little bit why I embrace this, like, persona. Because if I'm on the inside, I know I'm the clown, right? I can't be scared. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we have one more here. And th yeah. This is one I did up on our property. Um, and it's, yeah, thanks, Linda. It's meant to be creepy. <laughs> if you're creeped out, you should be. I hope when you go in the forest, Linda, next time you're looking for some guy like this. <laughs> um, this is on our property that got burned out. And I thought it would be a great scene for one of my self-portraits. And I drug a fog machine all around back in there. And I was sweating bullets. I think when I took my mask off, I went like this and took it off. And a like freaking bucket of water just drenched me because my sweat was all holding into the silicone mask. And so when I undid it off my face... It just leaked down and just freaking came out. It was it was awful and disgusting. Oh so, yeah, oh, you, you, you get really hot in a silicone mask. That is the creepiest. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So oh, yeah. if you guys have any ideas, I'm all open, right? Because again, the concepts are hard. Um, I've been trying to think of all the places you would not want to see this guy, right? How about so, your shower? Oh heck yeah, I'm already doing. <laughs> <laughs> yep. I try to figure out how to light these things, right? They're sort of, and to get a camera in there. So, I mean, short of building like a set, right? And having it where the camera is out and you can shoot into it. It's real tough to, you know, work in a real house on some of these things. Yes. So, but yeah, it's, that's one of my challenges for this series is again, to think conceptually and then think of the story and where the places are that I probably never want to see this dude. Like that would be really creepy and out in the forest like this sort of not hiding but butt hiding behind a tree, you yeah, know, uh, right. is really scary. Ah, so do you have any uh, ideas where the where this series is going to go? Uh, I do. I've got a couple. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna submit this to a couple uh, uh, publications later, and I mean maybe have a gallery showing of it when I get probably. I'm thinking like five or six, uh, uh -huh. and maybe it may maybe make it so that I step up the production and shoot like twice a year. Um, but I've got. Um, I've got a couple ideas where I'm going to be laying under a bed and there's a little kid sleeping on the top. So I can ah! bear, and I'm going to be just going like this going <laughs> like looking toward camera and going Shh, like that. Um, you know, the, the beautiful Disney like thing, like, like, you know, think of a scene where the little kids laying on the bed and like almost like Tinkerbell is going to come through the window, but nope, I'm laying under the bed. Yeah. So stuff okay. like that, I think is fascinating. Okay. <laughs> what a way to <laughs> wrap this up. Hey, um, and very definitely contact me. Uh, I'm sure we can find a place in Missling Gallery for you down in there. Oh, that'd be awesome, David. I'd oh, love right, it. When you get this. this I would love that. <laughs> that. That would make it just absolutely mind-blowing. It's not for everybody, though. <laughs> no, you not, no, 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 no. warning no. sign, right? Like, right, yeah. right. But I think it would stimulate, uh, let's say, air other photographers in the area to maybe see what uh, what we could fill the rest of the gallery with. Oh, yeah. If we what? use this as a centerpiece. I think, too, David, self, self portraiture is, is overlooked a lot, you know? We, we mm -hmm. all focus on, like, finding good subjects and stuff, but, I mean, we all are subjects. So, yeah. yeah. Well, you and, uh, what, uh, Cindy Sherman. Oh, she's a real dude. Yeah, she's awesome. I mean, she did her whole career with uh, self oh, right. Yeah, her conceptual work is awesome. Love yeah. it. So, anyway, fascinating. I yeah. I enjoyed this whole, you know, journey. I'm being a photographer myself. Uh, uh, this was fun. This was well, really I, cool. I appreciate you guys having me on. I love yeah. any, again, any tie to Modesto. Uh, it has to do with photography and, you know, and the city. I'm... I'm more than happy to like uh, help out with or, you know, be involved with. I, yeah.
Heart's I will. I will. I will call you and invite you down again for another. Oh, I love. I love another, you. another special show. That'd be great. So, thanks for being here. And uh, yeah. Thank we you will. so much, Aaron. It oh, really thanks, was Pat. fascinating. Okay. So it's four o'clock and we're done. So see everybody next week. Oh, I won't be here next week. Linda will be here next week. Mm -hmm. the guest. So, okay.